Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon, for the very uh, kind introduction, and thank you, everybody. I don't remember all the sponsors, but thank you, everybody, <laughs> um, for really putting this thing together. It is a real pleasure to be here, as Sharon said. Uh, it's my first visit uh, to Tucson, and um, besides the hot weather outside, um, uh, so far, so good. <laughs> so, um, so uh, just a brief uh, introduction to, to my organization, as Sharon requested. So the ROVI Institute is a nonprofit academic and research organization. We were founded in 1996. Um, and that actually is a, was quite an interesting time for us in Israel. Uh, the Oslo Accords had recently been signed. Uh, Jordan and Israel had entered into a peace treaty, and there was a real sense in those days that we were really seeing the end of the Israeli-Arab conflict. Of course, we all know um, where we are today. However, in those days, there was a real sense of optimism, and the Arab Institute was founded within that uh, time where it was understood that one of the areas that could really help promote cooperation amongst uh, Israel and her neighbors was the fact that we uh, share environmental resources. The one that's most obvious and, and critical in many ways is what I work on is, uh, is water. So it was in that, in that space that the Institute was established. We are uh, now 20 years uh, strong. Um, and what we do and have continued to do consistently with all the ups and downs in the politics in our region is to bring Jews and Arabs together to study the environment, which we share, uh, but also, in essence, to learn about one another um, uh, and to use the environment as a means to break down some of those stereotypes and to promote and foster understanding over the fact that we live together in a very small piece of the world and um, uh, we have to figure out a way to, to live together and share the very precious and scarce resources that we have. Um, if you want more information about the Institute, you can just find us online. The website is arava.org. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the work that we've been doing within my center, um, the Center for Transboundary Water Management, which is um, looking at the fact that uh, in our region there are many communities, whether they be in the West Bank, Jordan, uh, Israel as well, that are... Um, struggling to meet their basic needs in water, wastewater, and energy through the fact that um, access to infrastructure is challenging. Um, so we've been working on this for a number of years, and that's what I want to um, speak with you about. But before I get started, um, I wanted to, for my own um, education, to I, I attempted to do the following. And uh, you can... Uh, you can uh, tell me if, if I got the numbers right or wrong. Uh, most of these numbers are from um, USGS data. Some of them are from EPA data. But I tried to do some kind of comparison. Um, I've got Nevada up there because I'm going to be in Nevada as well. So, <laughs> But if you can, if, for example, if you look at population, Israel uh, has the largest population. Um, but we are the smallest in, the, in surface area. Um, there's not, not much of a difference. Israel does use less per water per capita, but um, I think Arizona is doing quite well as well. Um, I looked at the issue of agriculture because, as, as you know, if you work in the field of water, agriculture is the largest consumer. And here you can see that Israel is um, using less fresh, this is for potable water, is using less fresh water than both Arizona and Nevada. The economics of water, of course, is essential when you talk about policy, and this is one of the most difficult things to, to, to try to get a handle on. So I did want to try to sort of see, is there any way to compare um, prices? Um, very difficult. But I found a study that was commissioned um, uh, that looked at uh, uh, water prices in the United States, and they listed both Phoenix and Las Vegas. Um, so you can see there average monthly water bills for a family of four to 100 gallons per person per day. It's not a lot of money. I couldn't figure out how to do a direct comparison, so I'm putting up, this is actually from my water bill. I pay around just under $2 a cubic meter. So in Israel, too, uh, water is not that expensive. And of course, this is one of the biggest challenges one faces when we try to think about how to be better manage such a scarce uh, resource such as, such as water. 
Um, we all live in an arid region, whether it be Israel, Nevada, or Arizona. You can see their annual precipitation. Um, water uh, sources. So I know that Arizona and Nevada don't only use the Colorado, but it is basically the most important resource. Whereas in Israel, we have a number of sources of water. Most interesting, as Sharon alluded to briefly, was the fact that these days around 70% of our potable water is being produced by desalination by some of the world's largest facilities along the um, Mediterranean coast. Reclaimed water, Israel is also doing a, a lot here. 80% um, of our wastewater is being reclaimed for agriculture. I came across a figure of 3% in Arizona. That was from the USGS. I couldn't find anything about Nevada, but I'm sure they're doing some reclaimed water. So just to, you know, a little bit of comparisons um, uh, amongst our region, I think, is of, um, of interest. It was certainly of interest to me to learn a little bit about what's happening here in, in this part of the U.S. Southwest. So uh, in terms of off-grid communities, this is some, just some general uh, statements. Um, uh, we all know that uh, there are still a very large proportion of the world's population that are still struggling, struggling to meet these basic resource needs of water, sanitation, and electricity. Now, many of these communities uh, live in rural and semi-rural communities where it's not just about water for domestic purposes, but it's about water for agriculture. And this is, uh, could be having that water to provide for subsistence-based agriculture or to have that water so that um, agriculture can be a form of uh, income generation and, uh, and livelihoods. But the challenge is that until these communities have access to these services in an efficient way, meaning, of course, access to appropriate infrastructure, um, the ability for these communities to develop and grow in terms of improvements in economies and livelihoods and social economic development is always going to be limited. So in essence, if we are able to resolve the, the basic resource needs for these communities, um, improvements in livelihoods um, will or should, in essence, um, follow. Um, what's the situation of the off-grid situ uh, communities uh, in the part of the world that, um, that I work in? So, if we're talking about the Palestinian population in the West Bank, and of course the Palestinian uh, population is the West Bank and, and Gaza, but we're going to focus on the West Bank, you can see here uh, most of the population, 70% uh, live in a situation where access to centralized infrastructure, whether it be potable water, uh, a functioning electric grid, um, wastewater services, um, is lacking. Uh, it's approximately 30% of the Jordanian population, although I've come across figures that even make it higher, closer to 50%. Um, in Israel, more than 90% of the population is connected to these services, but within the specific population of the Bedouin, which is a minority community mostly in Israel's uh, southern Negev Desert, roughly 50% of the Bedouin population also faces these um, infrastructure um, challenges. Um, now, to sort of generally frame how one can think about um, providing these services, of course, the intersection um, of water, energy, and food is becoming more and more obvious, um, and uh, mo more work is being done to try to address um, the basic resource needs in a more comprehensive, integrated way. So we're talking, and of course, again, I think most people are aware the, the, the nexus um, perspective. Um, you need energy to treat water, you need water to produce energy, um, and you, of course, can't have any kind of food security without having both a reliable source of water and energy. Now, what complicates the, the kind of work that we do, um, and of course, this is also relevant to Arizona as well as most of the Southwest, is that all of our water resources are transboundary in nature. So there also is a, a political element in how we think about these, um, these issues. So to put this in, in uh, um, uh, context for people slightly unfamiliar with, with, uh, with the geography and hydrology, this is a map that shows some of the main major watersheds. Um, and what you can see, let's put, get the laser thing going. So here you see the, uh, the so-called, where am I? Yes. <laughs> here you see the so-called green line, um, which is the 1949 armistice line that separates Israel from the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, this is the extent of uh, our main groundwater resource, which is called the mountain aquifer system. So we have transboundary groundwater as well as 
surface water. These are all the main watersheds that mostly drain into the Mediterranean. Uh, some of them drain into the Jordan River and, uh, and uh, Dead Sea Basin. But what you can see is that all of these watersheds have most of their uh, uh, sources within the West Bank. Um, topographically, the West Bank is upstream from Israel, so all of these waters flow this way. Now, similar to what I think happens here, where most of the rivers and streams are mostly ephemeral, um, that's the situation in our part of the world. Uh, very few of these watersheds have perennial flow. They're mostly uh, ephemeral and therefore capture um, flood events uh, during the winter um, rainy season. So in essence, the challenge uh, for Israeli water management managers, as it is for Palestinian water managers, is if we are to develop sustainable practices, it's essential to think and um, about a watershed management approach. Again, watershed management is pretty much well understood and entrenched in water resources management these days, but given the complexity of the political situation and the transboundary nature, watershed management in, in Israel and in, in the Palestinians and in the region as a whole is not really happening, and so we have a lot of problems due to that transboundary nature. So one of the things that we've been doing at the Institute um, is to begin to see how we can map some of these watersheds and try to understand what's happening within the hydrological borders of these systems, um, whether they are partly in the Palestinian territories, partly in Israel, and so on, so that we can begin to come to a more comprehensive understanding um, uh, of how to best manage these uh, systems. So here's one example um, of some research that was conducted uh, uh, um, um, uh, at the Institute a few years ago. This is the um, Hebron Basor uh, Beersheba watershed. So this is the hydrological borders. I've always, you know, just as a quick aside, if you think about it, if our political borders were uh, uh, comparable to our hydrological borders, maybe many of the political issues that we're facing would be, would be different. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, but what you see here is the green line again. Uh, this is the upstream part of uh, the watershed. Uh, what we've done is we've mapped the different communities uh, the drainage uh, areas and so on. So this uh, up here, this, this purple, this is the Palestinian population. This is the city of Hebron up here. Uh, this is the city of Beersheba down here. This is the capital of the, of the Negev. You've got some smaller communities spread around. And then these are some of the Bedouin uh, communities here. Some of these Bedouin communities are um, uh, what we call recognized communities, meaning that the state... Um, recognizes the legality of those communities. We also have what are called unrecognized or informal communities where the state uh, does not recognize the legality of those uh, settlements. And of course, those settlements uh, are the ones that face most of the infrastructure challenges. So there's a, the, the bottom line with this is that when you map it out like this, you begin to see the complexity of how water is used within um, a basin. Um, and so this is part of, uh, of, of the work that we're trying to do, especially when you've got off-grid communities up here and as well uh, uh, in parts of the watershed down here. Now, as I, as I alluded to earlier, 70% of the Palestinian population is off-grid. In this case, the city of Hebron, which is roughly, uh, well, the city and surrounding communities is close to one million people. Uh, there's no wastewater treatment at all. So what happens to the wastewater? It basically just gets discharged into the environment and uh, drains um, into the system, uh, collected through this part here. This is called the Hebron stream, uh, which, as I say, is an ephemeral stream, but these days it's a perennial stream of sewage that is flowing uh, uh, from the Palestinian territories in the West Bank across the border um, into Israel. Now, this is not just domestic sewage. This is very problematic sewage because Hebron... Uh, is a very important area for industry, for the Palestinian economy. Um, so we have a lot of industrial sewage, agricultural sewage, all flowing in um, uh, with none of it being treated. Um, of course, the risk to the aquifer from this um, uh, sewage flow uh, is, is, is a concern to everybody, uh, as well as the public health issues of um, uh, uh, contamination and disease transfer from uh, from the sewage to, to neighboring communities and, um, and so on. To put this into context, 
um, the Israeli government uh, uh, actually did uh, quite a comprehensive study to try to put numbers on what's really happening with respect to this question of, um, of untreated wastewater. So this, is, uh, this was uh, a report. Oh, that's better. Okay, so this was a report that was done by the civil administration. The civil administration is uh, the um, agency uh, uh, that is responsible for the needs of the civilian population in the West Bank. Uh, the civil administration is part of the Israel Defense Forces, um, and their job is to provide basic services to all the residents within the West Bank, whether they be Jews or, or Palestinians. But basically, if you can, this, this is the amount of sewage being generated by the, uh, by the settlements. Uh, this is the amount of sewage that is being generated by the Palestinian communities. Um, it's around 21 million kilometers per year on the settlement side, around 69 million kilometers on the Palestinian side. The bottom line is focusing here. You can see 82% 80, of the sewage is not being uh, treated at all. It gets disposed directly into the environment. Some of it um, is um, discharged into open cesspits, uh, others directly into the streams, as, um, as you saw earlier, the Hebron stream. Um, the bottom line is that uh, we have about, what are we, just over 50 MCM per year of untreated sewage is being discharged from the Palestinian territories into, into Israel. We see uh, similar problems or, or less, uh, but similar problems on the settlement side um, as well. Another quick uh, snapshot from this report is you can see here what this means in terms of the different um, watersheds. So this is the Hebron watershed that I showed you the map of earlier. You can see uh, that basically um, over time it's basically just raw um, wastewater. This is the Kidron. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. That's a very important watershed that drains from Jerusalem towards, um, towards the Dead Sea. So... That's the big picture um, to try to put, uh, put it a little bit in context of, of, the, of um, what's happening. Now, what, what, what we were looking at, or what we are looking at as an institute, of course, we also understand that we can't exactly solve this problem on our own. But there is a piece of this that uh, we think, uh, as part of civil society, that we can address um, together with our Palestinian uh, partners that we work with collaboratively. And that is to look at the fact that in the rural communities of Palestine, you can see here that the majority of the community um, is relying on these porous cesspits. Now, of course, that's part of the problem. If you have a porous cesspit, you're actually encouraging the wastewater to infiltrate into the, into the aquifer. So uh, most of our work these days in the Institute is focusing on this part of the Palestinian population. Um, one thing that I always find of interest, maybe just again a little bit of a, an aside, but um, you can notice here in the West Bank that the best served communities happen to be the refugee camps. These camps are run by the UN agency, so that's where the money is. So it's sort of ironic that the refugee camps actually have some of the best infrastructure um, with regards to these issues. So this is, again, a snapshot of what's happening in... Um, uh, in, in the Palestinian context. Now, in Israel, when we talk about the, the off-grid challenges, it relates to the Bedouin. The Bedouin are the largest minority uh, uh, in the Negev, the southern part of Israel, approximately 200,000 people. It's the population that has one of the highest population growth rates in Israel and the world. Um, it's important to make a distinction that these are, of course, um, ethnically Arab and religiously Muslim people, but they are not Palestinian. They, do, they are uh, their own uh, distinct ethnicity, and uh, these are citizens of the state. And that's an important point, because as citizens of the state, they should, like any other citizen, uh, receive the basic services that all citizens of the state are, are required to, um, to receive. So according to the 2014 census, um, the Bedouin community is roughly 224,000. It's 27.4% of the total population of the Negev. Um, in 2014, the Bedouin citizens of Negev were around 13.2% of the total Arab population of Arabs in Israel, uh, which is roughly around 1.7 million, or 20% of the population of the, the country. Now, within the total uh, Bedouin population of the Negev, um, around half of the population, around 150,000, 
live in uh, uh, towns, meaning that these are no longer people that are pursuing a, a, a traditional uh, nomadic or semi-nomadic existence. Um, roughly 20,000 are living in what are called uh, recognized villages. Um, the rest of the population, around 55 to 60,000, are residing in unrecognized villages. Now, what we are focusing on at, at this point in our work is the roughly 20,000 population that live in recognized villages that even though the government formally has said these are communities that we recognize, meaning that um, it, it should be the government's responsibility to provide basic service, these communities still are struggling to meet their basic infrastructure uh, needs. Um, so here you can see uh, what, 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 what that means, that uh, the third point here is that in the recognized and unrecognized communities, Bedouin lack access to basic services. Um, water sanitation and solid waste is another really major challenge that these communities um, face. So whether we're talking about the Palestinians or the Bedouin, uh, uh, there are similar challenges. So our work has been to uh, try to focus on a solution uh, to the untreated wastewater that is being generated in these communities for many reasons, environmental protection, public health, um, and again, um, a, uh, an improved source of water for agriculture because of the rural nature of these communities. But we also understand that this is something that has to be done in a collaborative process that has to maybe go from the bottom to the top because at the end of the day, we must uh, involve the governments and the governments have to begin to take responsibility, including the private sector, um, to understand that one way to solve these problems is a what we call a decentralized approach, as opposed to what is the conventional thinking when one thinks about these issues, which is a centralized approach. Uh, so, so Sharon is asking, um, what about potable, access to potable water? So it's very variable. In some of the communities, the Bedouin communities, they have access to the grid. Many of them don't. So what does that mean? That means they have to bring uh, tanker water in at great cost, and there's no quality control on that water. Um, in other communities, they, uh, the, the Israeli national company, water company, sends a trunk line uh, close to the border of the community, and then it's up to the Bedouin themselves to connect to the trunk line at their own cost. But when they do that, they have a lot of problems with supply and pressure because they run because they don't have the money so they run these very um, small diameter pipes and they uh, and in the summertime they just they run out of water um, but it's variable some have access some don't. So in the in the terms of wastewater that have any it's pretty much across the board that these communities are struggling to meet their um, wastewater needs so this is just again to show you what ha what happens when you don't uh, have the ability to treat um, wastewater so this is a picture taken uh, at one of the Bedouin villages. This is the untreated wastewater flowing in the, uh, in the, in the basin. Um, now, as I said, solid waste is another problem. So this is all the garbage. You know, if, you're, if the river is polluted and smelly, well, just let's convert it also into an informal garbage dump. So uh, uh, solid waste management is another, main, another major um, uh, challenge. Um, here you can see again, so the sewage is discharged into open cesspits, which is an environmental challenge as, a, as well as a public health challenge. Here's a picture that shows you the situation. This is from the West Bank. Um, this is the sewage stream here. Here you can see again what the risks are. This is a Bedouin um, shepherd, and you can see that he's watering his, his goats, uh, and they're drinking this water, so you can imagine what the public health consequence of this is, if you're thinking about why is the water so milky. By the way, this was taken at the height of the summer, uh, and you can see how high the water is. Uh, the milky, uh, the high turbidity here is uh, because this water is draining from the city of Hebron, which has one of the largest concentrations of stone cutting and marble cutting um, in the West Bank. So all that limestone dust is basically uh, moving into the, um, into the channel. So public health impacts, of course, um, this is, again, something that is, is clear to most people, that there's a direct connection between sewage uh, and people's mor morbidity. Um, studies are being conducted by um, the public health community and the epidemiological community, and we see things, for example, diarrhea disease is one of the leading causes of hospitalization of Bedouin infants in Israel. Um, cesspits are also dangerous. Here's a, a cutting from a newspaper from a while back where uh, a child uh, drowned in a, 
in a, in a cesspit. This happens, um, this is not an irregular occurrence. Um, here's an anecdotal uh, quote from one of the doctors that service the Bedum population and says the following, diarrhea is much related to domestic hygiene. It does not matter how much you will keep the house clean as long as you're exposed to sewage, it's affecting intestinal diseases, especially in children. Dysentery is very common and without a doubt led to sewage. Children's morbidity is high due to waterborne diseases such as Brucella and Giardia lamblia. Dysentery and Giardia are common in children due to exposure to sewage. There is a direct connection between sewage exposure and morbidity from these diseases. So it's clear that we have some problems here. What is a solution? I don't want to say that it is the solution, although that's the title of the slide, but one of the solutions is what do we do? So what we are doing uh, is we are trying to provide small-scale infrastructure uh, uh, that could do two things. Firstly, uh, treat the black water, which of course is water coming directly out of the, the toilets, and instead of having that water be drained into open cesspits, uh, send that water into sealed septic tanks um, where the wastewater can be treated, um, and of course the biggest advantage here is groundwater protection. Uh, and, and therefore, and protection from, from disease. The second uh, part of this, of course, is that, uh, again, these communities are agricultural. So the need for water, other than, of course, basic uh, uh, domestic purposes, is agriculture. So gray water, which is roughly 70% of any household's wastewater generation, including in the United States, is that you can take that gray water, which is less polluted, and uh, if you can treat it, you can use it as a source of irrigation, whether it be for livestock, which of course is very important for the Bedouin, or, uh, or, uh, or regular agriculture. Um, and this can both uh, provide additional water and can have uh, economic um, benefits. So this is basically what we do. We go to uh, communities, um, whether it be in the West Bank or in the Bedouin community, and, and we, did, we are beginning some work in Jordan, where um, one thing, that we realized that actually got us thinking about decentralization as a solution is when we began to survey these communities, one thing that actually sort of jumped out at us at one point was because they rely on these cesspits, one of the biggest problems they have is what happens when the cesspit overflows, either because there's too much sewage or there's a, a, a flood event. Then you've got raw sewage you know, uh, flowing through your house, f contaminating your neighbor, and so on and so forth. So, because, and if you have to come and pump out your cesspit, it's very expensive to do. So, what these communities do, therefore, is to minimize the flooding of cesspits. They separate at source their black water from their gray water. Now, that's a huge advantage because if you want to install gray water systems, let's say here in the United States or in Israel proper, one of the biggest barriers to gray water treatment at a localized level is the separation of the black stream from the gray stream. That's very expensive to do. If you want to put in a gray water system in this building, for example, the technology is there, it can be done, but you would have to invest huge amounts of money to separate your black water line from your gray water line, and that makes it prohibitively expensive. It's one of the reasons why localized gray water um, is a challenge, unless, of course, it's built, put into the building code, and there's a range of barriers to getting this to be uh, more widespread. But in the Palestinian territories and in the Bedouin communities, they separate sort of like as an unwritten building code. So that's a huge advantage because if we, can, uh, uh, if we don't have to invest money in, in uh, separating the black water from the gray water so there's no risk of cross-contamination, then we can use you know, very uh, uh, accepted and proven technologies all around the world like um, constructed wetlands and other types of technologies to take the gray water and send it for treatment so it can go into um, reuse for agriculture or any other kinds of things. You can get super sophisticated and even have the water go back into the home for toilet flushing. There are examples of that as well. And the black water goes to um, the uh, sealed uh, cesspit. So here's an example of some of the work that we've been doing. This is in the Bedouin community in, in Israel, at, actually at, at a school, uh, because of course, Part of the work is to educate uh, and, and um, uh, um, promote the ideas within the community. So here we're using very simple um, gravel filtration, uh, sending the water uh, through one cubic meter containers, and as it goes by gravity flow um, to the point where the water can then be used safely for small scale farming. Here you can see the drip irrigation lines. Um, and all that we had to do was simply take the um, gray water and run it with a pipe 
uh, uh, and collect it and send it into the um, systems. We've noticed that when we do this, uh, you can quite rapidly, drastically improve um, crop yield. So here's an example from a project that we did in the West Bank. Um, we connected this home uh, to a system, uh, and very quickly the homeowner uh, understood that he had a, a good source of water, and he began to irrigate and, and show an increase in crop yields. These are um, cucumbers. What we're also doing is to, to optimize or maximize the reuse of grey water in agriculture. Not only do we install the system to treat the wastewater, but we also provide, where possible, um, small uh, greenhouses. So here's an example. Uh, this is near Ramallah. Uh, this is a different type of uh, technology. This is what's called an upflow gravel filtration, where you have anaerobic treatment here and aerobic treatment here of the grey water. The water then goes directly into a small greenhouse. This is what it looks like inside the greenhouse. These are tomatoes um, being irrigated with the treated gray water. Tomatoes, of course, are a very uh, good crop, um, and one can um, sell them in the, in the market. Here's another example. This is near um, uh, Nablus in the northern, northern West Bank, using the treated gray water for tree crop uh, irrigation. Here's uh, one of the uh, users, this is near a village in Bethlehem, uh, using the water for irrigation of, uh, of olive trees, which of course is a very important crop in the Middle East. Um, so we're at a point in our work that we feel quite confident that we have been able to uh, show uh, technical feasibility that this can be done with these different systems. But there's many, many other things that have to be done to be able to demonstrate that this can actually work um, at a larger scale. So where we are today in our work is trying to uh, see how to develop a sustainability of the system and scalability. Because at the end of the day, you know, treating the wastewater in one household is good for that family, but it still doesn't solve the bigger problem of the community. So it's essential, of course, to work with the community, to have an open and uh, transparent dialogue with the community, um, to understand what their needs are, and how to work with them. Local government support is also essential. In all the communities that we work in, we have both the community supporting us and the government supporting us. One of the next steps of our work is to develop the institutions that are need. This is the food, energy, water. Uh, you, community utilities need to be established to, to manage these systems. Um, capacity is a challenge. Operation and maintenance, of course, this is technology. Even if it's very low tech, things go wrong. And we're also trying to promote in the uh, West Bank specifically, for now, um, appropriate extension services so that farmers and users can understand how best to use grey water and the technology and so forth. Um, the, 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 the role of the, the private sector, I think, is essential. This goes back to thinking about operation and maintenance and also how one will uh, recover the capital investment of these systems and develop a source of revenue for, for the building of future systems. And probably... One of the most interesting and um, confounding uh, challenges is what we call beyond aid. Specifically, this is a problem, a problem in, the, um, in the West Bank and Jordan because if you look at the West Bank specifically and to a lesser extent in Jordan, these are donor-driven economies. Now, this is good and not good because when you work with the donors, their focus is very narrow. They're all about a three-year, or if you're lucky, a five-year project cycle. So you get the money, you build the system, everything is good, the project ends, and the tendency is that the systems quickly, rapidly decline and fail. So one of the sustainability challenges is how do you develop uh, this approach where you work with the donors at, at, an, at an entry level, but develop sustainability beyond. When we began our work, I was very interested to explore this issue. And we did a, a survey, and I have a PhD student now who, from Jordan who's uh, doing this work. And we wanted to do a, ask ourselves some question. We were not the first ones to come in and do this off-grid stuff. We knew that other people have done it before. So, so I said to myself, I said, well, if other people are doing this stuff uh, or have been, um, how successful have they been? So we went out and we surveyed over 100 systems that were 
uh, built uh, by different NGO communities, funded by a variety of donor agencies, and we found a 70% or higher failure rate of these systems. Because they were all donor-driven, it was very narrowly focused. There wasn't the investment in capacity. There wasn't the investment in governance. Um, and so as soon as there was a problem, let's say uh, your pump broke, or there was a blockage in your system, and there was an odor problem, the users had nowhere to go. So it, it invariably just gave up. And of course, in the end of the day, that comes back to, to make your work even harder, because you build it in the community a resistance to, to, uh, to these projects. So um, this, is a, this is a problem. I, it's, it, I think that's a global problem when you think about how aid is used in different parts of the world, and we're trying to um, develop, therefore, the, the sustainability approach goes beyond aid. Now, one of the uh, real challenges when you go off-grid, which goes to how do you get the government to support it, because at the end of the day, this really is the job of the government. The government, if, the, if, if these are citizens, the, these citizens as a basic human need, and, and of course water is a basic human right, the government should provide these services. But governments are very wary when one is trying to advocate for off-grid for a very valid reason, and that is because there's such a, a variability in technologies and uses and contexts in which these systems are put into place, it's very hard to have consistency in water quality. And that's very important, especially when the idea is to reuse the water, the effluent for irrigation. There are risk factors um, when one uses uh, treated uh, gray water in irrigation. So partly the reason why governments, and Israel is a perfect example of this, uh, favor and promote a centralized system of sewage treatment is because you can regulate, you can permit, you can assure consistency in water quality so that the risk factor to crops, to public health, to soil, to the groundwater um, is adequately prevented. Um, and they're right, because when we did water quality uh, uh, um, monitoring of various systems, you can see how variable it is. Um, and this is part of the problem. So what we are trying to do now is to see how to develop um, a decentralized water quality management protocol that could get us to a level of consistency across different systems in different places in the region so that governments can be slowly brought into the process to understand that, well, actually, yes, you can regulate off-grid as much as you can regulate on-grid. And, of course, it's exciting to work on this stuff because there's really cool technology now, um, remote sensing technologies, remote monitoring, you know, tying all of this in with um, cellular networks and smartphone technologies and all that kind of stuff. The so-called Internet of Things is, uh, is the new buzzword going around, or disruptive technology, you know, they, they say that in Watek, Sharon, they talked about that. So there's a lot of interesting uh, technologies that one can actually now put to use for a better um, um, quality control. So this is uh, one example we're working, this is an Israeli company, uh, where we use their sensors that uh, uh, take um, a, a, a regular water quality parameters uh, that are required for standards of, of, uh, of effluent um, quality for reuse, um, and they uh, communicate the data to a, to a data logger that sends that data to a centralized database, and in essence, with this kind of technology, one can begin to solve that regulatory challenge and slowly get the government to come on board. So this is um, a project that we're, start, we're, we're beginning, um, hopefully when I get back to Israel, we'll, we'll start the project. I want to end off with uh, an example of something else that we're doing, and that um, is another challenge that we face specifically um, in the Jordan Valley uh, of the West Bank, which is here. The Jordan Valley uh, is very similar to Arizona <laughs> to some degree, uh, very arid, uh, but uh, an area that's very important for agriculture, but the main source of uh, water for irrigation is groundwater, and the groundwater uh, requires the operation of very deep pumps. You can see 100 meter deep uh, wells, um, and this has a, a great strain on the farmers in terms of the electricity cost to keep these um, pumps running because the electricity grid, if it's there, is unreliable. Um, and uh, uh, expensive. So another uh, part of our work in, in, in um, uh, putting forward an off-grid approach um, is 
the uh, role of um, solar energy for groundwater pumping. And again, we always start with the feasibility assessment. So we went into the community and we said, what is important for you? And you can see that the most important issue that the farmers themselves said is energy. The cost of energy for groundwater pumping, yes, other issues, of course, also are important, but the biggest one was energy. So when we did the feasibility assessment, and this was the results of our surveys, we said, okay, well, if this is what is most uh, troubling you, let's see how we can resolve this um, problem. So here you can see that energy is expensive. It's around 35 to 40 US cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, average consumption is 14,000 kilowatt hours per month. Um, the, the amount of money that the farmers are spending uh, could be as much as 10,000 shekels, roughly two, two and a half thousand dollars a month just on running the pumps. So this is what we've done. It's nothing exceptional, but it works. We basically take conventional solar PV. Uh, this is the well house, and we connect the solar PV to the well house, and it's an offset mechanism. It's still connected to the grid, but by doing this, we are offsetting the cost of, of electricity from the grid by roughly uh, 30%, which is directly communicated to the farmers as an economic benefit, because all of a sudden, you just have to show, the, you know, what was your electricity bill before the project and, and after the project? So we were, uh, we did this project. This is the, the village we're working in. We're very excited that this was featured in the, uh, in the New York Times. And we think that this off-grid approach, of course, has relevance beyond um, these communities. One challenge that we are beginning to see how we can maybe have an impact uh, is specifically in Jordan and specifically the Syrian refugee population. Um, this is a, a visual of the Zatai refugee camp, home to around 200,000 people, completely off the grid. This is close to the, um, the Syrian border with um, Jordan. So an off-grid approach, I think, can also have value to refugee camps that, of course, are designed as disaster relief, uh, but what happens if the disaster doesn't end? These uh, people are not going back to Syria anytime soon. They may never go back to Syria. So what starts off as a temporary humanitarian response where it's let's get those people water and food and basic shelter, now Zatara is one of the largest permanent cities in Jordan and it's completely off the grid. Um, and my final slide uh, is uh, to what degree may this be relevant to, to Arizona? Um, and that could be potentially the fact that um, Native American communities are also struggling, so I just briefly found some information. I am no expert on this at all, but um, uh, just to, to, if you're not familiar, so this was uh, um, some information I found from the Indian Health Service, and i just read it, it says, adequate sanitation facilities are lacking in approximately 145,000 American Indian and Alaska Native homes, or 36%. Of these homes, approximately 26,000, or 6.5%, lack access to a safe water supply and or waste disposal facilities compared to less than 1% of homes in the US general population. So uh, maybe the work that we're doing in the, in the Middle East could have relevance um, to help solving some of the off-grid challenges that are also taking place here in the, in the Southwest. Um, and thank you very much.